Your mind is limitless. The possibilities are endless. Awaken Your Mind Magic shows you how you can dream limitlessly and live your life on a new level. Susan Kathleen speaks with ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives using the power of their minds. Abundance, prosperity, and success. There are no limits to what you can dream. Join Susan Kathleen on a journey into your dreams, making a difference and living life on your own terms. This is Awaken Your Mind Magic. Hello and welcome everyone. My guest speaker today is Andrew Bone, who currently lives in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Andrew is an internationally acclaimed wildlife artist who is dedicated to conservation and awareness of the never-ending struggle of Africa's diminishing wildlife. He is first and foremost a conservationist whose passion is the African bush and in love with the continent of his birth. But most importantly, an artist who has worked at producing paintings of such breathtaking excellence and beauty that they exude the very essence of Africa. Andrew's passion started five decades ago when he went to Falcom School in Zimbabwe. It was then known, the country, as Rhodesia. The school was, is situated in the African bush where he came to know and understand the indigenous flora and fauna of the land. He was conscripted into the army, the Rhodesian army, after leaving school, as all young men were from the age of 18. And this was in the country in the 1970s, and this was to fight the Rhodesian Bush War. Basically, it was happening at the same time as the Vietnam War, and which once again presented an opportunity to be out in the wild, albeit under not such peaceful circumstances. And it was during this time as a soldier that he was first introduced to mana pools and the Zambezi River which were to change his life forever. As the Zambezi River and Mana Pools did for me as a young girl living in the African wild, where I too started to paint and write my poetry of the tall yellow grasses and the wild animals. I resonate so much with Andrew. He is from my country. He is one of my people. Welcome, Andrew. It's wonderful to have you with us here on Awaken Your Mind Magic. Susan, thanks so much for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you, and welcome to everybody who's listening in. Andrew, you've had a really mixed and interesting life. Tell us your story and what makes you want to see the world the way you do, and it leads into your limitless creativity. Thanks, Susan. I suppose for most children brought up in then Rhodesia, my story is not exceptional. You only realize when you have your own children, and I have three beautiful daughters, how much your parents sacrificed to give you private education. Having achieved average grades in my education and just scraping through my O-level art, I, alongside all of the young men of my age group, were enlisted into the military for the following 18 months. At that time, I was, the Rhodesia was fighting a bush war on multiple fronts from China, Russia, and Britain, who had imposed international sanctions in our country. I have mixed emotions about my war. I enjoyed the regimental structure. I enjoyed the comradeship. I enjoyed the outdoor environment. And if I'm honest with myself, I enjoyed the thrill and excitement of battle. There really was not time to be concerned with the big picture. Physically, I was unscathed. Uh, mentally, I think it made me a better person, unintentionally more prepared for an afterlife and guiding. The real price would only be paid, I suppose, at the moment when Rhodesia fell. Zimbabwe was created, and I was left wondering what it was all for. The cost of my war was a badly injured brother, 
a best friend killed in action, and the walking wounded from both sides of the conflict. PTSD amongst my colleagues was a tangible thing. Many left the countries with their families and many never fully recovered. A year later and after a string of meaningless jobs, I was offered to accompany a friend of, of mine on an exploratory canoe trip down the Zambezi River. I accepted, fell in love with the valley and became a guide at Prokomachi Camp, which is in the Marna Pools. It was there that I met my wife, Kelly, who was working for the one of the tourist companies and we began spending time with each other on my time off. When the tourist season closed at the onset of the rains, I accepted a position at a private game reserve. It was there that we married in 1986. And I began a bit of painting and sketching in the evenings when there were no clients in camp. For a while, we had Kelly's cousin staying with us and he wanted to learn how to be a guide. At the time, I would run weekly survival courses in the park and following one of these courses, I returned home to find that all my paintings and sketches had disappeared. Cousin Ian and my wife had conspired to take my art into town and sold it. <laughs> that was when the big decision came to concentrate on my painting. For a number of years, my life was split between guiding trips to the valley and traveling to the USA for exhibitions. Twelve years ago, I was approached by Park West Gallery, and since then, my life has been pleasantly chaotic dividing my time between painting, traveling all over the world, exhibiting with Park West Gallery, photographic trips to the bush, and my conservation and work and writing. Andrew, thank you so much for sharing about, uh, with that. Uh, tell us more about Park West Gallery. Um, you mentioned about them. Um, uh, explain further about them and what your work is with them. It's quite an amazing story the way I was picked up by Park West Gallery. Now, Park West Gallery is the largest art marketing company in the world. If you look at any of the, the cruise lines, they've all got Park West exhibitions on the whole time. They've all got online auctions. It's a massive, massive company. And I knew nothing about them, and I was pottering around doing all my shows in the States. I was doing arts in the park. Uh, I was I was doing uh, the Seattle shows. I was just doing anything I could to try and get myself out there. And um, it came to a stage where I had done a quite a big show at the Safari Club International, which I never really enjoyed doing because of the the hunting aspects of it. Yeah. And I had also got an agent uh, who had put my art into a horrible gallery, which was which didn't suit my art at all. And uh, the show was okay, and I was, uh, I was standing in uh, Miami outside of the, the gallery, and I've been in there and said, look, I, I've got to take my art out of here. Um, I'm not happy with my, my agent. I'm not happy with the gallery. I'm not happy with anything. Um, so I was standing on the outside of this gallery, and uh, I had a phone call from them um, and saying, you know, we want you to sign up with, the, with, with our gallery. And it was really exciting because I said, well, what's the next step in this? They said, well, we're going to sign an agreement and we're going to collect all your art that you've been spreading all the way through America with these different little galleries. Um, and we're going to pay you for the art and then we're going to start marketing you properly. So very exciting. Since then, I haven't had to do really any of my own shows. Everything's laid on for me. Um, they, 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 they do treat their artists very, very well. And so obviously it's, it's in the media all the time. Um, it's nice to be the only African artist as well, so there's no there's no competition. But I, I do enjoy my traveling, I do enjoy my cruises, um, and I do enjoy talking personally to my collectors one on one at the auctions. I actually affiliate with Park West Galleries because in 2008 I was uh, invited across out of thousands of people to train as a Park West Gallery auctioneer and online shipping gallery ma uh, manager. So I can associate very much with the art that's sold there. And amongst some of the best art that I sold, it was art that belonged to this fellow by the name of Andrew Bone. <laughs> and Thank I was, you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was able to sell it really well because I had an equal passion for the bush and the animals and the flora and fauna as you do. So there is nothing like having passion for something to be able to sell it. 
<laughs> so this is where people don't understand the enormity, the massiveness of the gallery that you actually work for. It is the largest art gallery in the world. And when cruise liners are back on, on, on the ocean and able to operate, imagine every single shipping line with the Park West galleries, they're known as Park West at Sea, selling Andrew's work. So it's... It, it is a, it, he's quite a... Sorry, he's it, quite it a, is amazing. Yeah, he's quite an artist. <laughs> It is amazing in that one of the um, sales talks that they do to the, the new recruits, um, the new auctioneers who are coming online, is it's, it's kind of a Muhammad Ali kind of thing. They, they do say, if you take the amount of people who are witnessing your art every single day, the amount of originals you sell, and the amount of limited edition prints I sell, I'm the most successful wildlife artist in the world. So, like Muhammad Ali said, you know, it's, it's not breaking if you can if you can uh, back it up, but it is it is a, a wonderful opportunity to sell my art without the headache and hardship of having to do and organise my own shows, um, and I get to talk to to clients and customers about my conservation and about the art, um, and I don't have to worry about about the flying and the booking of hotels and shows and. Um, Absolutely. Fr shipping, framing, yeah, yeah. It's all done for you. But, and you then can follow your passion and your creativity without all the stress of that business side of things, which is a great relief, I should think, for any artist. Tell us about your conservation and your passion. The, 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 um, you have a charity, don't you? Yes, I have. I have what is known as the Forever Wild Foundation. That's a quite an interesting journey in itself. Um, I was very involved with conservation up in Zimbabwe, um, and I was a member of the Wildlife Association of the Zambezi Valley. I used to help out and do a lot of the anti-poaching. Uh, the the, uh, the game counts was always a very interesting time because we had to go out and monitor water points. Um, so I was very involved with it there. And then when we came down to South Africa, I really didn't want to get too involved with it again because it was quite time consuming and it becomes more than just a passion. It becomes something that takes a priority over your art. Um, and I didn't really want to be in that situation again since I just signed up with Park West Gallery and, and I had to fulfill obligations there. And then um, one day, members of the uh, association came to me here in KwaZulu-Natal who are associated with the Shoshlui and Falozi Game Reserve. Now, Shoshlui and Falozi has got the history of breeding up the rhino populations in Southern Africa from almost zero. They were the last stronghold of rhinos in the whole of Southern Africa, breeding them up to a point where they've been taking them to all parts of, the, of, of Southern Africa, to the extent where there is no black or white rhino in Southern Africa that doesn't have a gene pool associated going back decades and decades to Shishlui and Falozi. So working with these people with the same passion, they had had some wild dogs in a boma, which is an enclosure. Mm -hmm. And they, these dogs had actually skipped out of their, the, uh, the national park. They had managed to, to collect them again before the, the uh, farmers got hold of them. So obviously they don't treat them very well. And um, they, one of the local game rangers had also got hold of some of these wild dogs. So they put them in this big pen and said, well, we hope they're going to bond into a pack. Now, this was in the Mkuzi game reserve, which is close to Shishlui and Pelosi. And Mkuzi was the traditional hunting ground for the Zulu chief. And the wild dog had been eradicated there 150 years before, so they were wanting to reintroduce them. Yeah. But they said, we don't have the money. These dogs are ready for introduction. We can't buy the collars. We haven't got the drugs. Can you help us out? So I put out a bit of a plea to my collectors, and, and one of my collectors came up and gave me $10,000. He said, well, hopefully this is going to help you out. For the moment, I refused the money simply because I wanted to make it legitimate. I didn't yeah. want somebody pointing fingers at me and saying, what happened to the money? It's that bottomless bit of Africa in the third world where everything just goes missing. So I created with, a, with some friends of mine a foundation properly recognized um, and it's been properly recognized in the States as well as a 503 one c 
um, charitable institution. And once I'd had it up and running, I then took this very, very kind gesture of $10,000, managed to purchase the, the collars, and was actually involved in the collaring and relocation of these, of these wild oak. And it was just absolutely breathtaking to watch these wild oak leave the boma, the enclosure, and go hunting for the very first time with some fairly sort of complacent impala, which had got used to the dogs being on the other side of a barrier. So they learned <laughs> a pretty quick lesson. I then went on to um, assist in any way possible with, the, with, with other wild dog relocations. We then got involved with the, the lion, uh, the, the gene pool of the lion, which needed an importation of, of brand new blood from the Kalahari Desert, which is many, many miles away from, the, from Zulunad. Yeah. And that was also just absolutely awe-inspiring for a, a, a plane to be coming out of the sky, open the doors, and there's a veterinary officer sitting in there with, with three comatose, fully grown male lions. Oh, my um, gosh. Offloading them into the back. <laughs> Offloading them into the back of a Land Rover, <laughs> taking them to the national park and offloading them there and putting on collars, and it was really, really exciting. So, so from there, we've we've gone from um, the importation of new bloodlines of, of wild dog to lion, and now we're very, very heavy, heavily involved in the cheetah relocation from the in the national park that I deal with, Trishri and Falozi. Only had two wild two cheetah there for some time. And uh, we've been importing cheetah, buying cheetah um, from other parts of the of Southern Africa, and uh, and putting them in there. Now we have a population of eleven, and two of the females have one of them's pregnant, and the others just had three cubs. So it's it's a very very encouraging, successful relocation that we've been doing with them too. And Forever Wild um, is, is heavily financially involved in all of that with the veterinary uh, equipment, the, the, the vets themselves, paying for their time, paying for transport. Um, but yeah, basically, all, all the facets of it. And, and I find it very, very exciting and very emotional when we manage to do a successful relocation. Well, I think it's wonderful because the... We both know, and I think people in particular from Africa are very aware of the diminishing amount of game throughout the African continent. I mean, there's some countries that really have no no game at all, and it's totally tragic. So what you're doing is you're recreating this gene pool in order to be able to ensure that our future generations, our grandchildren and our, our grandchildren's children get to see the beautiful animals that we grew up with in the African bush. Is there any, um, um, can, can you purchase anything in order to be able to help assist towards this, um, this wonderful charity? Do you have an online e-store or anything like that, Andrew, where people knowingly um, can purchase something and know it's going to go towards this charity? Well, it's what we've done is we've adapted our needs to um, to, to to what we – sorry. We've, we've adapted our equipment to what our needs are in Africa. Obviously, everything – is different for every situation. We're not trying to go out and, and, and dart bears. We're not trying to move elk, uh, wolf packs, that sort of thing. So what we've done is we've actually changed the, the technology from the rest of the world to our own needs, as in the size of collars that you need for a wild dog compared with lion. Um, the, the tracking and monitoring equipment obviously is, is hugely different from what we use um, in America or, or New Zealand is where they actually really have done this monitoring equipment very, very well. So now what, what we do, what we need is, is money. Um, and that money goes straight into a controlled account and that goes to, to, to the Forever Wild Association here. And then we pass it on, not in cash, but in kind, to the uh, groups that are working with animals. So, for example, um, the ACT, who are a monitoring group, will say to us, um, listen, we, you've, you've been so kind to us in the past. 
um, putting collars on our cheetah. However, those collars have only got a two-year battery life. We have to replace the collars. So we're needing new collars. We're needing to have the veterinary equipment to put these dogs down and put on new collars. So I will actually go out and purchase um, the, the collars from a company and actually hand over physically collars. Now, I can, I can tell you now categorically that every cent that comes to the Forever Wild Foundation is used for exactly what we're needing. None of it goes into my diesel Land Rover. None of it goes into <laughs> hotel bills. None of it goes into director's payments. It is just purely 100% for what we need. And, and that is passed by my foundation um, as to exactly what the needs are and how we can sort them out. What I do to try and uh, bring funds into the foundation is the one thing I'm allowed to do with, with Park West is reproduce my sketches. So what I've been doing in the past, and it's been very, very successful with my clients overseas, is they can actually purchase a limited edition sketch uh, which comes with a letter of authenticity and it'll be posted to them in America or wherever. It's very inexpensive. Um, you can get it, you can get them on my foundation website. And um, all those funds that from these collectors, there's only a hundred of each edition that, that are, are, are signed by me. All those funds go to the Forever Wild Foundation, 100% of them. Um, so we've successfully raised last year enough to put in a brand new boma, um, relocate five lions with all their monitoring equipment, all the veterinary skills that we needed, uh, relocate seven cheetah and purchase seven cheetah, which are not, not inexpensive, um, and also pay for uh, a secondary boma which has gone up. So, so we, we basically paid tens of, tens of thousands of dollars uh, to very, very worthwhile needs. And it's, it's an equipment which National Parks could never afford to do it by themselves. Uh, they're relying so much on uh, individuals and small associations now to help them out, concerned groups who have got the interests at heart, because so much of this money is just willfully being spent by, by government, uh, where it's, it should be going to national parks and it's being spent on, on frivolous things. So we're a stop gap. I see ourselves as, as the first line in the needs of national parks. Uh, to do what they see as a really important work, which is not seen as that important by governing bodies. Is this because they do not see their animals as important? They think it's more important to perhaps go and purchase themselves a nice house or something like that? It's, it's, a, it's a universal problem in that the people who are put into these positions are not qualified to be there. They're, uh, they're, they're cadres of the ruling party. Um, you, it's very, very difficult for these national parks officers when they're dealing with somebody who doesn't know the problems on the ground. Uh, and he would prefer to have a brand new Land Cruiser than potter around in a third, third generation Land Cruiser doing exactly the same work. Um, now that's... That, that's 100,000 rand, which could quite easily go to importing um, new bloodstock, to repairing fences, um, to replacing collars. You know, they see it as, as more of a, a perk to, for their position than actually filling a niche that they're supposed to be. It's, it's, a, it's a third world story, and I think it probably happens a lot in first world countries. It says here it's it's far more prevalent because there's so little resources uh, yeah. coming in that you can play around with. I understand there. So you would advocate uh, correct training for people who are taking the position of, well, taking the superior position of being in charge of different parks and wildlife foundations, not foundations, but the government foundations, um, they really should be people who know what they're doing and love their animals and their flora and fauna. Sure. Let me, let me give you an example of where it does work is Botswana. Now, Botswana for a number of years has been run very, very well, especially in their, on their wildlife side. And that is because the, the president, Karma, was actually a member of national parks for a number of years as the minister of national parks. I think he did it like four or five years with national parks. 
um, seeing all the problems on the ground, seeing the the wealth that that is generated by the national parks, and then when he became president, he continued that that theory of saying, listen, we need to look after our natural resources and we need to do it properly. So for many, many years, the National Parks in Botswana has been done very, very well because you have a sympathetic president yeah. who understands that it's a generation of tourism that you're looking for. You need money coming in. So what would happen is if you would go and stay at one of their National Parks lodges, the revenue from that would go directly to national parks. It wouldn't go into the general coffers of the government. And so it was the, the main front line of raising funds was actually from national parks themselves. And they would benefit from those, those funds. So the better it was run, the more tourism, the more funds, the better you could run it again. So it really is a, a, a country of success because they've got leadership who is sympathetic to the needs of the country. Well, it's absolutely tragic that the leadership throughout Africa, um, except for countries like um, Botswana, have no idea and no f uh, foresight of what future generations can benefit from, in particular tourism, because it's a natural way of people generating massive income for every single country. And those countries were rich in wildlife, in game, and the flora and fauna. What are your thoughts of um, the destruction of trees throughout Africa, the deforestation? Oh, um, it's absolutely tragic. I mean, if you have a look at areas of um, northern Mozambique, they are just they're just absolutely clubbing everything that they can i mean it's it's gone from uh, really old hardwoods to uh, virtual saplings now um, and it's just it's just being pulled out by the millions of tons um, of, of beautiful lead woods of mahoganies of teaks um, you can see it throughout africa because when you don't have an economy, you don't have people who are able to sell their, the fruits of their labors, which might be in, in crops or livestock, uh, because they don't have those facilities anymore. So what they do is they start cutting down trees and making charcoal and selling bags of charcoal to the Chinese or the Yemenis or whoever don't actually have the natural resources for themselves in those. So the, the, the raping and pillaging of, of Africa is something which is, affects me a lot. Um, we, you can actually, if you can stand in a hill in the Shishlui, which overlooks the, the tribal land next door, and there's a fence line, and one of them is beautifully um, forestated with, with, with grass, and straight on the other side is just a desert. There's just nothing growing there, and it's, it's just goats, the odd goat. Now, that isn't the fault of the, the local people who are living there. That's the fault of the people who are in charge of government, who should be getting these people to have a reliable income from the national parks, uh, from animal husbandry, from cropping. Um, there should be uh, people walking around showing them the, the right ways of doing things in their farming. But what they're doing is they're just being left to, the, to themselves. And then what will happen is they'll look over the fence and they'll see impala grazing and kudu and things and zebra and think, well, you know, I need to feed my family. So they go over and start poaching. Um, they, start, um, they start shooting rhino for their horns. You know, they, they start thinking, well, we can actually make a living out of, out of this, this poaching. And then we have to bring in a shoot-to-kill policy because they're killing our, our wildlife. Um, so they're coming over and there might be uh, two rhino there and they don't see it as a natural resource. What they see is that's going to be worth $10,000 to me if I can shoot this rhino and get away with it. And then you have national parks, you come and they, they, they shoot the poacher. So it becomes an ugly cycle of um, when does a poacher become a poacher for the needs of his family and when does he become a poacher for commercial gain? Um, but if you see a, um, a local guy in your national park and he's got an AK-47 rifle, you assume that he's not there to, to shoot an impala for his family. He's there to shoot a rhino for the Chinese market. 
And uh, the, the circle just continues to, to go round and round. When we speak about these people from Africa who are poor, who have been exploited by various people, including their governments, and the government people are taking these, the, 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 the spoils of what these people are harvesting or culling, who are the main instigators worldwide who have encouraged them for their hardwoods and for their rhino horn? We, you touched on the Chinese. Where do these things get sure, shipped? Sure. Okay, so um, if you have a look at ivory, um, if you have a look at, at, at rhino horn, um, if you look at pangolins, which is a terrible disaster which is happening right before our very eyes at the moment, the, the plight of the pangolin, it's all going to the Orientals. Um, the North Yemenis have always traditionally made uh, dagger handles out of rhino horn. When your son reaches the age of maturity, if you've got a lot of money, uh, oil money, uh, you give him a dagger horn, sorry, a rhino dagger for, uh, as, a, as a gift. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of it is just education. A lot of Chinese don't think that you can actually harvest ivory and the ivory will carry on growing. They don't understand that you actually kill an elephant for its ivory. Um, so what you, what you have is a catch-22 where, especially with the rhino, you think, well, yeah, the rhino horn will come back. If we can f harvest the rhino horn and actually have rhino farms, we can supply these markets. Um, your rhino is continuing to, to, to live and this horn will grow at two inches a year. And you can have 150 rhino uh, and, you, and you just actually run them like cattle. However, because of his, historically what the, the rhino population has been decimated, you can't, you can't do that anymore because it's just like you are not allowed to ship rhino horn anywhere. It's the same as ivory, where Zimbabwe has masses and masses of ivory, which is, which is stocked away which from either uh, legal culling uh, or poaching or, or the, de the natural death of animals. And they've got warehouses of ivory and they can't actually sell it anywhere because you're going to be encouraging it. So um, it's always your outside markets that dictate the situation of any animal. The, the, the pangolin, which um, they believe is really responsible for the pandemic, which is happening at the moment. And I don't want to dissuade anybody from that because I do believe it came from the wet markets in China, yes. from Wuhan. Um, I, I don't want to dissuade anybody from thinking that the, the, the virus came from pangolins um, because maybe they'll stop eating pangolins and, and trading in their scales. Um, so I, I would hate anybody to come up with a, the proof that it actually came from a laboratory. I, I'm quite happy with the, the, the wet markets in the Orient uh, coming under scrutiny for all of their horrific trade and wildlife. I agree um, with you. And that's from anything, you know, snakes to rats to bats to pangolins to absolutely, you know, to dogs to cats. You know, you've, people just have to get over that and, and go and have something to eat at a restaurant or, or go to a butcher or just become vegetarian. I don't care what you do, but stop the belief that these things are actually beneficial to your health, they're not. It's just, it's just you, you're not going to become more sexually aware if you eat the scales of a pangolin. So a lot of it is education, which I think is, is starting to turn the corner. I think that there are enough people out there who are starting to work on the beliefs of people that, that hopefully we can bring this dreadful trade to an end because that is, is to me, the, 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 the black day in, in mankind is, is when you look at the horrific trade in these poor animals and the conditions that they're in, you know, anything from parakeets, lovebirds, um, you know, just your, your vulture uh, killing at the moment is horrendous. The, and and what, where that comes from, just to let your people know, um, is there was one of the, the witch doctors sent out 
um, a story that if you put the head of a vulture under your pillow, you'll have a dream and, and foresee the winning lotto ticket number. Oh, my and goodness. And for that sake, oh. for that sake, these animals have been persecuted almost to extinction. Because people, everybody wants to put a vulture head under their, under their pillow. Now, that to me is, is where your government could step in and send out a whole lot of people to start learning the truth about, about the vulture and the fact that this doesn't work. But your, your peasants are peasants, you know, until you get an education at, at, at your primary schools, at your secondary schools, you're, not, you're never going to get a chance to, to re-educate people um, in the ways of medicine. They're still going to think that the traditional ways will work. It's very tragic, and and hence COVID nineteen. I believe that it is out there worldwide, and may it be a lesson to people that, like you say, these things do not make you um, the biggest, most sexual person because you've had pangolin scales or rhino horn, or make you the best fighter because you have a dagger a dagger handle made out of some elephant tusk or rhino horn or any of those things. Um, superstition is, uh, is so rife in so many places. And it is very tragic that because of that, because of the consumer market of, of people who have the wealth in this world, exploit our, um, our tribal African or, or, the, or the, um, the peasants, as, as we call them now, um, I might have been speaking out of turn saying tribal. <laughs> However, they are exploited. Yeah. Um, let me give you a, a, a case in point. We, we're having a huge population now with the, the poaching of lions. And that has come about because they've basically hunted the tiger to extinction. And the Orients believe in, in tiger bone soup. And they think that that gives you these mystical powers. So now that they've run out of tiger bone soup, what they're doing is they are ex exporting, they're killing and exporting lions, lion bones for exactly the same reason. Now, part of the, the, the horrendous trade in wildlife to me is the, is the canned lion hunting. And it's something that, that I just, uh, I, I'm absolutely beside myself every single day that, that this has been allowed to continue in a civilized country like South Africa where you have these canned lion hunts, and you have these petting zoos. Um, you know, this doesn't bode well for the lion population at all. What is, what is happening is, is you, 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 you get a, a, a lion cub, um, which, has been, which has been basically bred in captivity, and you're having a petting zoo. So you, as, as Joe the tourist, will go to Africa, and you're going to go to a petting zoo, which you can pet a, um, a lion cub at one of these places. Then when the lion cub gets a little bit too old for that, you're going to go to Africa and you're going to go and you're going to walk with lions. It's going to be a walk, lion walking safari. You're going to walk with these three-quarter grown lions. Um, and then what happens when that lion outgrows that, then you have to somehow get more money from that, that, that creature and you're going to put it out for a canned lion hunt. And then your American or your German or your English guy is going to come in and he's going to pay $10,000 to go and shoot a lion in an enclosure. Um, so the, the whole story is tragic from this, this poor little lion cub. And where it starts is your petting zoo, where you go there in total naivety, thinking that you're going to have this wonderful experience, but you have no idea what that cycle of that lion is, is life. It's, it's just going to get from bad to worse, and eventually he's going to be shot in this enclosure. Um, now, none of those lions can be repatriated uh, to the wild. There are thousands of them in captivity throughout the world. Um, this Joe Exotic and his tiger thing, I refuse to watch it because I just know I'm going to become totally incensed by watching it. Um, so what we need is education, not there in, in the tribal areas, but you need education in your very wealthy tourist to, to not come out and go to a petting zoo, to not go and shoot an, a lion in enclosure, can lion hunting, to not walk with elephants, to not ride on elephants. This is where the, the whole financial system comes from to uphold these abhorrent um, entertainment 
that, that, that people just so desperately want to do, but they realize it's for all the wrong reasons. So if, if anybody can take anything out of what we've been talking about today, just become very, very aware as a tourist where your tourist dollar is going to. You can either do a lot of good um, and you can sit on the banks of the Zambezi River and have a gin and tonic, or you can go and pet a lion. And I'll tell you which is the right way of doing it. Explain canned, the word canned. Explain that to our listeners. Okay, a canned lion hunt is, um, look, one of my passions is, is, is getting into um, the big game hunting, the trophy hunting. We have had the, 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 the biggest elephants in the world uh, the biggest lions in the world, uh, the biggest kudu, the biggest zebra, the biggest buffalo, everything has just been shot out. And that is actually a gene in these animals. Um, so we're killing off that, the, the big game gene, as it were, by these uh, professional hunters coming in. Um, it's, it's not hunting uh, to, to cull, which I, I, I do agree with. I do believe that if you have... Um, too many deer, if you have too many impala, if you have too many elephants, it's got to be professionally cold, it's got to be controlled, otherwise your animals are just going to end up in starvation. So you've got two sides of, of the coin. You, you have uh, professional hunting, which is one thing, um, and then you have canned hunting, which is the other. Now, a, a canned hunt is where you don't have to travel anywhere. It's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a hunt on tap for you. You come and you're going to spend two days in a lion reserve and you're going to go out after coffee in the morning. They already know exactly which lion you're going to be, you're going to be killing. This lion is actually a little bit drugged anyway because they fed it that night. You're going to come, it's going to be underneath the tree resting because it's half drugged and you're going to shoot the lion under the tree and then you're going to go back and have breakfast. That is a canned hunt and it is absolutely atrocious. Um, the, the, uh, the other side of the, of the hunting coin is is, is just about as bad in that your, your, your hunting association have earmarked animals which are big enough to be shot. Um, and somebody will pay a lot of money to come and do like a, a five or six day hunt. Um, and you'll, you'll, this is where your, your big um, hunting associations like your, your Vegas Hunting Association, International Hunters Associations, um, will be promoting and, and selling these hunts uh, live to people uh, or online, you know, you can come and you can shoot your bag um, at a hunting reserve and you can have two impala, three warthog, two baboons, a kudu, a zebra, an elephant, a lion, a leopard. And you can pay a lot of money for it. You're not going to go in there and shoot um, an elephant which has got 10 pounds a side of ivory. You're going to go and shoot the big guys who they've been monitoring for a couple of years, you're going to pay a lot of money to go and shoot an elephant with 60 pounds a side. Um, but no, you, you, that, that animal's dead. Uh, you can't use it for tourism anymore. You can't have people taking photographs of it. Um, so you have the conservation um, people like myself who, who say that hunting should be strictly regulated. It should be for culling purposes only. Um, if you're going to have a hunter come in and he wants to shoot his, his zebra and impala, make sure that there's, a, there's an excess stock of that. Make sure it's done professionally. It's done as humanely as possible. Um, you don't use a bow and arrow. Uh, you don't you use exactly the right caliber. I, I, I know how to hunt. I used to do all the game culling. I've hunted hundreds and hundreds of animals successfully and as carefully and as humanely as possible because it was something that was needed to be done. So I know both sides of the coin. I know how to unethically hunt. I've seen it and I've argued so many times against it. Um, and I know to, how to hunt humanely and for the right reasons. So having seen both sides of the coin, um, I've become a stronger and stronger advocate for these mom and pop uh, hunting escapades that come out to Africa and they just blast away and they're all dressed in their camouflage and um, they've all got their mod cons. Um, it's, it's, it's gone away from the, the old type of hunting with the Bushmen, with the Inuit Indians, uh, where it's hunting for a reason, uh, you're actually cropping, um, and there's, there's, um, there's a lot of seriousness about why you're doing it. Not this jovial, let's go and have a couple of scotches after going bagging a, an elephant, which 
has been walking the planet for 60 years. Um, we just don't have those numbers anymore. They, they, there's no law in Southern Africa about, about killing an animal which has been collared for scientific reasons, for one reason or another. Maybe it's a very mature animal. Um, there's no reason why if that animal doesn't stray onto a hunting area, which is right next to the reserve, a hunter can't shoot it. Now, that to me is a travesty of the law. You know, if you've got an animal which is being monitored for scientific reasons for one reason or another, this is coming back to Cecil the Lion, which everybody knows so much about. Yes. Um, there, was also, there was also uh, two very well-known um, elephants, uh, one in Namibia and uh, one in Botswana, which have recently been shot as soon as they walk out the, air, the, the reserve mm. um, by hunting associations. And there's no reason why people can't hunt them legally but there should be every law in the world which says that they can't. So we need to change our mentality as well. I totally agree with you, Andrew. And, you know, we have, we have all these amazing resources and make the ability to make more money out of tourism and being able to shoot with a camera rather than a gun. And as you say, you've had experience of using a firearm. And now that brings me back to asking you, when you were a bush ranger, you talked about doing the, the survival uh, courses and trails. How is it that you became a, a ranger with the, with the ability to do survival courses and trails? What were you doing before to become that? Well, obviously, my, my military training put me in good stead. Um, and then what I was able to do was transfer that, that knowledge and that, I suppose the skill of being outdoors, being in the wild, being in different situations. Um, and I was, I was taken on by a, a, a fine lad. His name is Garth Thompson. Garth Thompson, I was reading the other day, is still one of the t best 10 guides in Africa. Um, and I had the pleasure of under, under studying him. Um, and Garth, taught me as a, as a young guide um, the, the, that knowledge goes beyond the big five, the, an elephant spore, um, a lion spore. It goes to different grasses, different birds, different trees. And I started learning in the evenings. Um, a, a customer or a client would say to me, um, what, what bird is that? And if I didn't know, I'd say, and it would become one of the best phrases I ever, I ever learned was, I don't know, but I will find out for you. And in the evening, we had all the reference books there, and I would sit in front of the fire, and I would talk about the bird, and I would look it up, and I would say, okay, that, that was a, a giant kingfisher, <coughs> excuse me, or, or whatever it was. And I'd read up about the, the habits of a giant kingfisher. Um, and it's the same with your, your trees, um, your different types of, of felt flower. Um, and... The more you learned, the more you realized you had no idea uh, how it all worked. And I specifically remember I was doing a, a, a walk with some clients in, in the Zambezi Valley. Uh, and there was this very sort of nondescript, very quiet chap at the back of this, this, this crowd that I was taking around. And, you know, we were obviously looking for the, all the, the big five and uh, fish eagles and this sort of thing. And, you know, it really, you just listened. You just took it all in. So I was a little bit kind of weary about, about this, this, this sort of strong, silent guy. Um, and eventually on the last day, we were walking past a, an ant mound, a termite mound. And he said, look, I, I don't want to sort of break your walk here, your concentration, but do you know what this is? So I said, yeah, so it's an ant bear. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a termite mound. He says, do you know anything about it? So I said, well, termites live in it. <laughs> said, can I can I tell you about a termite mouse? So I said, well, where are you talking from? And he said, I'm an entomologist who studies termites. And we sat there probably for an hour talking about termites and, and all their reproductive skills and how they can have new queens and kings and how they, the, the whole labyrinth works underneath. And, and it just made me realize that everybody has their knowledge. Everybody has their skills. And all you have to do to increase your own knowledge is to listen to them. Um, so then I was able to start imparting more knowledge to people. And Garth 
at, at Rakomachi camp was running these kids camps, um, survival courses, which we used to do basically um, in the army. I mean, everybody had to know how to put a drip in somebody's arm, um, how to do some field dressing, um, how to survive. But not to the extent that we would teach these kids because it was all very, very fascinating to, to everybody, including me, of um, the uses of a bear bear pod, of how to make fire, how to boil an egg without, without water. Um, and, and then you would see the kids' different personalities coming out, um, what they were good at. And, and so you would start building on those kids. Um, and it was, it was quite interesting. Um, I was actually at a, at a restaurant uh, just a few years ago, and this young man came up to me. And he said, he said, uh, Andy, do you remember me? So I said, I have absolutely no idea who you are. <laughs> and he said, you, you took, took me on a survival course at Drakomachi Camp. And I said, well, look, he, he said, well, I don't expect you to remember me because, you know, you, were, you had all these kids coming through. And he says, and, you know, it's been, it was 30 years ago, whatever it was. Um, he said, but, you know, you put me in good stead for the rest of my life. And he says, I'm actually a... Um, I work in the bush now for a, 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 a tourist company. He said, but you instilled that in me, and, and I do survival courses now um, at, this, at this camp. So I said, well, you're obviously one of the very few who's continued with the, the passion. And he said, no, he said, the passion's with everybody. It's just I was able to, to hone my passion and continue it in life. Uh, so it was really interesting sitting around a campfire at night uh, with 12 kids, um, and what we used to do is, is, is just drive to an area or, or canoe to an area and say, right, we're here for 24 hours. We have to eat something. We have to uh, make a fire. Um, we have to keep warm. Um, <clears throat> and you would teach them the different uh, weeds that you could eat, is what we used to call in Zimbabwe, derere, um, <laughs> and you used to boil them down. Um, and then we used to give them an egg and say, yeah, tomorrow morning, you're either going to have this broken on your, your head and you're going to spend the rest of the hot day with this egg yolk all over you and you're going to oh be my. really rancid by the end of the day, or you're going to have cooked it and you're going to eat it and that's going to be your breakfast. And you've got all night to do it. And you would watch kids, you know, how they would, how they would work amongst themselves. And if one group had successfully made fire, you taught them the rudiments of it. Um, and then they would, they would start. And then you'd have an unsuccessful group of kids who hadn't made their fire. And they'd make a plan to go and steal the next piece, the next group's fire when they weren't <laughs> watching. And think, you know, it was just how it would grow. Um, what the one kid said to me, you know, we'd canoe to, this, to the island. We called it Starvation Island in the middle of the Zambezi. And we said, right, we're here for 24 hours. Um, and this kid came up to me and he said, yeah, we also had a motorboat just in case there was a, a problem. This kid came up to me and said, you know, I didn't know we were going to be doing this, and I actually have to have my inhaler. Uh, yeah, it's medical. So I said, okay, well, jump in the boat, and it will take you back, um, and you can get your inhaler, and then we'll come back down. And um, sitting around the fire that night, we each other either did or did not make our own individual fires, but this, this group had. Um, and they really had a nice fire going, and I, I sort of snuck up through the bushes at night in the full moon and was watching these kids, and they were eating a, a big box of sweets, uh, um, crunchies or something. I was watching this, and I, eventually I went up to the I said, okay, so who's made a plan here? And he said, and this kid said, yeah, it was me. I said, but I, you just wanted your inhaler. He says, no. He said, what I wanted was a big box of, of, uh, of, of crackers and some matches because I knew we would have to do this. And I said, and he, he thought he was going to be in real trouble. And I said, so no, you made an absolutely perfect plan, you know, well done for you. And uh, yeah, he, was, he was cunning, but there was a sort of enjoyment I would get on is, is watching these kids together. You certainly are a, a very um, kind person as well because obviously you love your animals, but you love humanity as well. And this leads me to asking you, when did you first realize you wanted to become an artist? Because, I mean, you had this love for the bush. You could have carried on doing what you were doing. And, you know, obviously you did your sketches and everything. Your lovely wife <laughs> stole your sketches and took them off. But what was that, that real sort of 
light bulb moment that you wanted to be a full-time artist? I would say that the defining moment uh, came one day late afternoon in the Zambezi Valley. I had no clients. And what we used to do, if we had that sort of time off, is go to special places which we wouldn't let other people go to because they were so special to us. And, and my sort of special quiet place was actually behind the camp on the, um, on the shelf uh, in quite a thickly wooded area. And I would be able to sit there, um, apart from study things, I'd sit there with my binoculars and I'd listen to the fish eagles and I'd listen to the baboons calling and there was just total peace and quiet. Um, while this the whole of nature just en enveloped you. And I was sitting there late afternoon, my back was against a, a tree, uh, looking out over the floodplain in the Zambezi River. And I heard a, a slight cough, and then there was a slight urine smell. And I looked along this game path to my right, and there was this most beautiful leopard padding towards me, and his concentration was actually looking down over the... Uh, over the floodplain for impala or baboon or whatever he was going to start hunting. And he hadn't noticed me there because I was also very quiet, sort of camouflaged um, in the dappled sunlight. And I was just watching this leopard just getting closer and closer to me. There was no, there was no panic. I, I, I've yet to hear, hear of anybody who's been injured by a leopard um, that hasn't been put in a situation uh, where he is going to get injured. So I was perfectly safe. I knew that the leopard would, would move off first. But then when it, maybe it was 20, 20 feet away, this leopard just suddenly stopped and, and saw me. And, and I just, those eyes just went straight through my soul. And it was like, he, he knew that he was on level terms. It wasn't like oh, a human being, I'd better get out of here. And he was just sort of looked at me as an equal. Um, and it was just mystifying, just looking at that, that the, uh, the colors on the coat, the, the fine um, coloring, the, the markings, the, the eyes, the whiskers. And uh, we must have stayed there for 10, 15 seconds, but it was a long 10 or 15 seconds, and I just absorbed everything that I saw. And then suddenly he just thought, okay, well, I'd better get out here. And in a single bound, he was gone uh, off the path into the, uh, into the bush. And I, I was just left there just thinking, you know, if there was some way that I could possibly interpret what I'd just seen, if there was some way that I, I could more than my, my power of description, uh, more than my memory, if I can try and capture that somehow. And I suppose that's when I first thought, well, you know, maybe I should try painting one. And it was really terrible art. Um, but I started getting into it. I started, I suppose, honing my skills because I'm self-taught. Um, you start off with, with pretty bad art, which fortunately people didn't know the standard at that stage. And they, they, they had no idea where it would get to eventually. But um, you, you start off with your very basic sketches, playing around with a little bit of watercolor. Um, and then I would, I would start using my photographs, which I'd been taking, um, to get my anatomy right. And, I, and then I tried um, duplicating my, my photographs. I'd say, okay, well, look, there's a photograph of a leopard, which I was pretty good at uh, taking photographs. Um, how close can I get to, to painting this animal as it is? And I think that that's where I got the, the basics of um, a, a perfect example of what I'm trying to paint. I don't want to make an impression of an, of an elephant, of an elephant charge. I didn't want to sort of like if you look through all these pinks and purples and, and all these multitude of colors and uh, angles that you might sort of pick out an elephant. Um, I thought... Let's do this as well as I can. And so if it was the, an elephant ear with the veining of an elephant ear, the slight mud on, on an elephant ear, I would try and depict that exactly as it was. Uh, so I think that that's also where I started studying my forebearers in art. Um, and there are a few of them who, who to this day I'm in absolute awe of. And that would be like David Shepard, who to me was the Muhammad Ali of art. He brought the, the, uh, the interest and the, and the big money to, to art. Um, there's this guy, Simon Coombs, who's a, a very, who was a very, very good Kenyan artist. Um, and unfortunately, he was killed by a buffalo in Kenya 
um, mm -hmm. on safari um, is uh, Ray Harris Ching, who's a New Zealand artist and, and a fine artist. So um, Donald Grant's another one. I think that these people, I, I, I didn't try duplicating their art. I didn't try replicating it. What I did was I, I, I saw just how good they were. And if I could get to their standard uh, and do it my way, then I'd be, I'd be on the way to success. And I think in, 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 a, in a way I, I have achieved it. I certainly believe you have. I mean, your work, the fur on your animals, you, can, you feel you can stroke it. The, the, um, the way you depict your, your, your flora and fauna right down to a small dung beetle is exactly how it is. So you are gifting the world with the exact replica of what can be seen in the bush. And that is amazing, Andrew. It really is. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to ask you is you do have a wonderful coffee table book at the moment. And are you at the moment thinking of creating another book? And I, I, what, what is your first book called? Brushstrokes of Africa uh, is a book that, that I had planned for many, many years. Um, and it was quite interesting in that when I, I started writing the prelude for it um, and then it went into publication, we had to change the decades uh, that I'd been working for it because it was like after two, I'd been working on this book for two decades and then it became three decades. So we actually uh, had to change it. Um, and Park West Gallery used that book for all their marketing purposes now and, and it goes to their, their big collectors. So I, I began pondering with the idea a couple of years ago about having a book which would be for everybody. And I, I decided to start working on Artist of Africa um, because that's basically what I am. I, I am an artist of Africa. And um, working with all the sketches and studies, as you mentioned, dung beetles, uh, everything out there fascinates me. And I try and do as many of these non-ordinary animals as possible. So you'll see, uh, you'll see studies of, of uh, honey, honey badgers, of um, hornbills, of fish eagles, of dung beetles, um, of meerkats. Um, and they're all from my different trips throughout, throughout Southern Africa, through the, the Kalahari to the skeleton coast. I've done um, uh, studies of seals. I've done shipwrecks. Um, it was just whatever catches my eye. So I thought, you know, maybe I should start doing, a, a compiling a book now, which I have found very interesting through my exploits to try and compile, um, using a lot of um, a lot of information about my my journeys to these different areas, these different national parks, uh, be it the Luangwa Valley in Zambia to the um, to the Skeleton Coast in Namibia, and um, then with not, not too much narration, not, it's, it's not all about me, it's about the animals, it's about what, what captured my interest to, to first of all sketch that dung beetle, um, where I was when I was charged by that elephant, um, on the game path, you know, trying to recollect that, that leopard that padded towards me. So it's a book which I'm very excited about. Um, I, I, I had compiled like uh, 230 pages of this book, and I thought, okay, well, it's, it's, it's good, but it's got no fabric. It's got no body to it. So I started rewriting the whole thing again a short while ago. Um, and every evening I'll sit down and I'll put the next couple of pages on. But it's been done with, with care in that I'm picking a piece of my art, which I've enjoyed painting, uh, which somebody has enjoyed collecting. And I'm putting a little bit of narration around what actually inspired me to, to do that, be it one of the national parks be in a situation, be sitting in front of a campfire at night and uh, sketching a scops owl. Um, so that, that's what it's about. It's about it's about Africa. It's about the inhabitants of, of Africa and hopefully a lot of conservation um, and, and my concerns and my what I've tried to achieve and people of my kind have tried to achieve 
in, in, in trying to secure a place in Africa for its wild inhabitants. You're a great storyteller, and I believe that whatever's in that book is going to be a book well worth having. I've met David Shepard a couple of times. I've even had dinner with him, and he's an incredible storyteller. And to be quite honest with you, just chatting to you now, and I've spoken to you previously as well. We'll tell that story another day. But the thing is, you remind me of David Shepard in many ways. Your art is certainly, in my estimate, and perhaps that's because I'm biased because you were born in the same country as me, I think it's superior to David's. Um, I'm not saying it's not, uh, that David Shepard's art is not good because I've always really think, thought he's amazing, but it's looser than yours. Yours is spot on. But he was an incredible storyteller. And I think anybody who has that passion for wildlife has a story or two to tell. Tell us about one of your favorite stories from one of your story, from, from one of your safaris. I'd, I'd say the most memorable was, was shared by um, my brother-in-law. Uh, we were heading off to Mana Pools and we were going to um, look for water points on the uh, Rokomachi River. And it was the middle of summer. It, it was really, really hot. It's a dry sand riverbed uh, full of animals, quite dangerous animals too. And I said to him, to, to his name's Kali. And I said, Kali, look, we're going to be doing this walk. I want you to get fit. Uh, it's going to be a walk of a lifetime, but you really need to, to be in shape for this. And anyway, he arrived on our doorstep from holiday from, in South Africa. Uh, the tea plantations of Natal, no less, uh, up in the misty mountains of Natal, uh, into the hot, arid Zambezi Valley, um, totally out of shape. So anyway, we started the walk, and there, was a, there were three of us. There was a friend of mine. Uh, who is a professional guide, and myself and, and Kali. And uh, he started taking a lot of strain quite quickly with the heat. Um, eventually, he went down. On day two, we, we ran out of water. Um, and uh, we were looking for, for elephant diggings, but we were driven away by bees from the elephant diggings. Um, <laughs> and then he's, he went down with, uh, with heat stroke. So he was, he was vomiting, and, and I suppose my military knowledge came in, and we knew, I knew what to do about that. Um, eventually, I was carrying his pack as well, and he was sort of stumbling around, and we were resting up as much as possible. And then the one evening, um, we, had to, we had to make camp quite early. Now, making camp there is just simply putting your sleeping bag under a bush um, because you're sleeping out in the open. There was no tents because we were traveling quite light. And we went out and found a little bit of water uh, from an old um, uh, water digging. And um, we boiled it up so we could drink it. It was still pretty foul, but we could, we could drink it. And, I, and uh, I, I noticed there was a lot of lion spore all the way around. I, I was quite concerned about it. And we were like right, right on the edge of the riverbank. Uh, there's no, obviously no, no water in it, so it was all sand. Um, and we were probably... Uh, about 40 kilometers short of where we should have been um, to, for a pickup. And so I, I made sure that Kelly had had water to drink and something to eat, and I, I actually put him on his um, sleeping bag with his head under a bush so there's nothing would attack his head at, at, at night. And um, it wasn't long after dark that the lions started, and uh, eventually we were surrounded by this... By this um, this group of lions, which at night, I mean, it really did sound quite horrendous with them sort of calling to each other and gathering around us. And we weren't allowed to, to light a fire because that was a poachers thing. Poachers would light fires and the national parks would hone in on the, on the heat of the fire. And they would, then generally you'd start having a, a, a bit of a poaching war going on. So we didn't have a fire. And, I would kind of sit up and I'd shine my torch and shout at these lion and they were getting closer and closer um, and there were a lot of them. And my, my brother-in-law started, he started snoring, but his, his snoring sounded like a, like a wounded buffalo. It was just so bad. Oh, and I'd shake his foot and I'd say, like, Kelly, you know, you've got to stop doing this. This is, 
<laughs> you're endangering us all now. Like, sorry, 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 so sorry. But he was like half unconscious anyway because he was um, he wasn't well with uh, with t- with the salt deprivation. And um, eventually, I nodded off myself. Uh, you know, I just couldn't stay awake all night. Um, and I actually woke up with this foul breath in my face, and I immediately lashed off. And this tail whacked me in the face as I tried sitting up, and I shouted. And and uh, and Calvin, who was my my friend, he started he started screaming and reaching for his rifle. And there was just total bedlam. There was dust and stuff. And what happened was this lion pride had, had gathered around us and, and we were coming for Cully because he was like the wounded one. Um, and anyway, eventually I said, no, Kelvin, we, we have to make a fire. This is crazy, you know, because these lions aren't going to, they're just not going to back away. Um, but it was interesting the next, the next morning when we looked and, and saw the, um, all the spore that that lion pug mark was either side of my head. Uh, and it actually breathed into my face. Um, and fortunately, it was a lioness and it bounded back instead of actually lashing out at me. Um, but that was, that was pretty exciting. It was, it was interesting, the, um, the stories that came out after that um, from people who met for the first time. Uh, saying, oh, are you the guy who, who actually slapped that lion? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just really happy that the, the lion didn't slap me. But it was, it was a kind of a harrowing... People can't do that kind of thing anymore. You know, you can't go out there and, and no. walk in the wild. So I was very, very privileged to have been in that and, and many other examples of, of being put up trees, being chased by elephant, being chased by lion. Um, and it's something that just doesn't happen now because of, the, of, the, of the, all the restrictions. But, so I was very really blessed to be part of that era. Yeah, I'd say you were very blessed to still be telling the story as well, because I know what lion are like. <laughs> yeah. So I'm very glad you're here to tell that story. My gosh, um, this is this is just so fascinating, and I, I'm going to have to bring you back for another podcast because, wow, you you are the storyteller, the the story the African storyteller whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, tell me what you you enjoy doing when when you're not painting, apart from being chased by lions and nearly eaten up by them. What do you like doing apart from painting? Okay, well, obviously conservation is my big love, mm-hmm. um, and 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 imparting my knowledge of it. Um, I, I enjoy doing that. Um, in fact, in uh, Three days time. I'm travelling up to one of the, uh, the, the the parks, and we've we've been told to uh, source a cheetah, which is needing relocation there. They don't have the the, the the manpower to do it, so I'm going up the friend of mine, probably for four or five days, and try and find this cheetah, which we're needing to move out, and and we're going to relocate that with the other the other cheetah that we've been with on Shishlui and Falozi. But one thing that's taking up my time now, which is quite interesting, is for my last show, I was I was sitting at the airport, and um, I decided to kill a bit of time to uh, go to the duty free uh, shop, and, and I was just absolutely gobsmacked by the rubbish which is out there. I'm talking about the artwork on on things like T-shirts and mugs and plates and scarves, and uh, and I was just like, how can people be buying this absolute rubbish? <laughs> and it's like being, people are being force-fed this because there's nothing else. Yeah. So I, I got in touch with a friend of mine from, at the airport, and I said, you know, and his name's Felix. Um, he's actually on the, on the um, Forever Wild Foundation with me. Um, and I said, Felix, you know, this, we can do this. this. There's a niche in this market for putting good artwork on good quality stuff, which people can take home with them. Because right now, what I've been witnessing here is, is devastating to me. Um, so we came back and uh, actually with my daughter, who's a, who's a qualified lawyer, she's always had an interest in, in my art. And I said to her, I said, are you going to practice law for the rest of your life? And she said, I really don't like law. I, I don't like the, the, the dark side of law, yeah. collecting money off people and, and um, breaking up marriages and things like that. And, and I, I don't like it at all. I would like to do something in, in art. So I said, well, why don't you and Felix and myself 
create a company and start putting good artwork on good merchandise. And people can collect stuff to me, which is memorable and not just there's nothing else to collect. So I might as well do this. Um, so that's been taking up a lot of my time um, and, and a lot of my creativity, putting like a really cool elephant painting on a really good quality t-shirt. Um, and, and obviously with lockdown at the moment, and there's been no tourism, um, it's been a, a really great opportunity for me to explore all the different avenues. So things like um, my sketches on mugs, um, I brought out a, a whole selection, six glass placemats with dung beetles, different dung beetles on. Um, we're doing elephant images, um, lion, leopards, um, zebra, all on, on, on T-shirts. And, you know, the only company outside of one small firm in the, in the Cape which actually do T-shirts to this standard is actually in Australia. And what they were doing was they were selling these from Australia to the tourist market here. And to me, that is not made with pride in South Africa. You know, if you're going to live in a country, you've got to support the economy. Yes. So we're dealing with a very, very cool company, um, which, is, which is in the Cape, uh, who are doing this, these magnificent T-shirts for us. And I want everything in, in place for when the tourism opens, uh, that people can start purchasing really, really good images on good, nice merchandise with, with, uh, with interest. Not just sort of look around and say, well, what's the price of that? People shouldn't ask that. People should be saying, I've got to have that. It doesn't matter what it costs. I so totally agree I'm with bringing you. Out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, we're not doing cheap and nasty. We're doing really nice, fine collectible, collectible stuff. Um, and a portion of that is going to get, be going to the, uh, to the foundation. Um, I'm also decided to, to bring out a calendar for next year, which is 100% of that is going to go to the foundation. Um, greeting cards. So it's all, we're, we're creating an entire industry around my art um, for two reasons. First of all, to support the, 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 the industries of this country, but also to support the conservation. Um, of, of this country that we live in and, and hopefully of, of Southern Africa as a whole. That's wonderful. What's the name of this company? The, the, the name of the, the company is Tambo Creations and that actually means bone in Zulu. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a play on words, but uh, it's, um, it's wholly South African uh, and... We hopefully it's just going to go from, from strength, strength to strength. Oh, that, I, and I wish you all the best for that. So Tabu in Zulu means bone, so, yeah. and you Ta are yeah. Andrew yeah. Bowden. Andrew <laughs> I love Bowden. it. Yeah, so they, they'll be able to follow that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that people will really want to buy that merchandise because you are an incredible creator, an amazing artist. Tell us how people can get hold of you. Do you have a website or um, a Facebook page or anything like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously on, on Facebook, I'm just straight under, under Andrew Bone. Um, there is, I, I don't understand a lot of this media, but um, my daughter controls an Instagram, which, which is also there. Um, so if they want to reach out to do anything with the, the uh, Forever Wild Foundation or my art or what we're going to be doing with the, uh, the, the creations, um, they can contact me primarily just through, through that, through Andrew Bone. Um, and then there's also the Forever Wild Foundation, Foundation website where they could contact me as well, but they can go directly to the website if they wish to make any contributions there. So it's the uh, foreverwildfoundation.com is the, uh, the website there. And do you have an email where people can contact you or a phone number that they can call in if they want to be able to contribute towards your foundation? Yeah, they could contact me at, at Andrew Bone, A-N-D-R-E-W-B-O-N-E, at telcom, S-A-T-E-L-K-O-M, dot, 
um, telcomsa.net, I think it is, yeah, Andrew Byrne at telcomsa.net. And they can contact me there and, and um, I will direct whatever they want to, whichever, if they want to deal with the foundation or with the creations or my art. Um, it's best because I look at that every day and um, it's kind of my office time that I, I set myself. I have to do my office time every day before I can go to the studio. <laughs> well, that's a very good thing to do. I do too. Otherwise, I want to go and play in the art in the art room. <laughs> so I empathise. I know. I know how it feels. Oh my goodness, to be a creative and have to work. <laughs> Andrew, I'm going to ask you for all your links, which I will put up on this podcast as well, where people can find you. Right now, I wish you so much success with with everything, all your endeavours, and. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to me all the way here in Australia and you all the way over there in South Africa. I really do appreciate it. And I know that anybody who listens to this podcast is going to warm to you hugely. I want to buy one of your paintings, I should think. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Bye-bye, Andrew. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks very much for everything. Bye-bye. That's Awaken Your Mind Magic for another week. If anything you've heard today has really impacted you and you want to know more or you would just like to connect with me, then visit my website, awakenyourmindmagic.com and reach out for a free one-on-one -on -one discovery session with me. Next week, where I'll be discussing more tools to unlock your dreams and live a limitless life that you would truly love to live. I'm Susan Kathleen, and this has been Awaken Your Mind Magic.